Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see you all. Well, I can't see you, but to know that you're there, 494 and counting. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, I am uh, in a day job. I'm uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Medical Sciences. So um, I, I'm a neurologist by background. Can I just check um, before I say any more, um, Fiona, um, are you just able to confirm that you're now seeing my slides on yep. the screen? Yep, I can see your slides. That looks fine to me. So, oh. yeah, I'll give you a shout if, if anything changes, but for now it looks fine. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So um, what I'm going to do um, is um, hopefully enthuse you all with where I started as a neurologist um, is my training, um, which was between Newcastle and then down to London, then back up to Newcastle, um, subspecialising in an area called movement disorders and obviously a condition that I'm sure you've all heard of. And indeed, sadly, you may have relations, uh, friends that have been affected with Parkinson's. Um, and that's something that's dominated my professional life for, for really many years. Um, and it's something that I'm, well, become known with internationally in terms of the uh, area of Parkinson's and in particular, um, the dementia that can occur with Parkinson's. So what I thought I would do for you tonight is do a little bit of a look back in the history because that's always really interesting. And then we'll take a look at the sort of the here and now about how we're diagnosing Parkinson's and treating it um, and some of the drawbacks of the current treatments. And then we'll take a little look into the future, which is where you will all hopefully come in because you're all going to go into do new neurology and all going to do Parkinson's and hopefully you'll all find new drugs and treatments to make it easier for people with the condition to to manage and to live longer. So this is a potted history. This is just not doing it justice as you can imagine but this has been a really exciting and ongoing voyage starting way back in 1817 just after the Battle of Waterloo. So just imagine that where James Parkinson described the shaking palsy and he really was quite a Quite a polymath was James. He uh, There's no photographs of him in existence, by the way. You, you will not find a genuine photograph of James Parkinson anywhere. Um, and he basically did all sorts of things in his lifetime, from describing uh, how you would treat hernias with the use of a truss, through to the effects of lightning strikes, through to writing, writing under the pseudonym of Old Hubert, um, pamphlets on social and governmental reform. But what he did do, and which, of course, we remember him for, is describing the uh, condition that he saw in six patients, only six patients. And if we now fast forward to 1888, Charcot, the brilliant French neurologist working at the Salpetriere in Paris, was the first to propose in a lecture on the 12th of June 1988 that it should be called Parkinson's disease. And indeed, um, he was the first to also question that palsy was not a good name because people with Parkinson's were not weak as such. And palsy or paralysis agitans, as it was also called, because they used a lot of Latin back then, um, was also not a good term because people were not paralysed either. And I'll just quote you um, a wonderful little phrase from Charcot, which says it all. Um, this is about James Parkinson's monograph. So Charcot said, it is a small pamphlet, almost impossible to find. As short as the work is, it contains a number of superb ideas. Read the entire book and it will provide you with the satisfaction and knowledge that one always gleans from a direct clinical description made by an honest and careful observer. And I would just like to leave that thought with you because no matter how much technologies come along now in recent times, you can't beat in the field of neurology and movement disorders in particular, clinical skills, clinical acumen. They are still so, so important. Anyway, if we move on now, uh, Tretiakov was a pathologist and he described classic changes in the brainstem. And then even further on, Carlson and Oleg Honikiewicz describe what really has been a seminal finding in, in an animal model where they depleted the brain of dopamine and recapitulated a lot of the features of Parkinson's through that dopamine loss. It was then Kotsias who first used neat levodopa, so he used gram doses of levodopa, um, to treat 
people with, at the time, quite advanced Parkinson's and demonstrate benefit. They also had a lot of side effects because of the sheer high dose of levodopa that needed using. And then in 19, and then so that then led to a whole raft of treatments that came in, which I've omitted and um, we'll come back to in a, a later slides. But in 1997 was when the genetics started to kick in. And this is where um, in a very large Greek kindred, um, this protein, which we'll come back to as well, called alpha synuclein, which is a really key protein um, in Parkinson's and some related disorders where abnormal synuclein accumulates. That, that was first described and that opened up a whole myriad of possibilities in terms of working out what causes Parkinson's as well as how we possibly might treat it. And then also in the 1990s, there was the re-emergence of surgical treatments, and we'll come back to those as well. So there's a real, in one slide, a potted history of, of Parkinson's disease. Now, we then kind of look forward to what we've now got available. Well, even these techniques were not available when I was a lad in training. We had to send people down to London for an MRI scan if we needed them to have one. And you all can imagine, we, we thought very carefully and long and hard before we, we did that. Of course, every hospital now has got an MRI scanner. And these images on the left, the A, B, C and D, show various different sequences, which is how you program the scanner, to be able to look at the brainstem um, so effectively, you've got um, what look like sort of Mickey Mouse ears almost, but they, they, that is the midbrain, um, which is where a lot of the pathology of Parkinson's resides. Um, and I won't bore you with the anatomical details, but effectively, the scan is almost now of such resolution, it's able to pick out changes of Parkinson's in the living brain, which is just quite incredible. And in, indeed, on the right, is a different kind of scan, which is looking not so much at structure, because you might think that looks a bit smudgy and blurry, but it's actually looking at function. And what it's looking at is the way that dopamine in the brain is, is taken up into terminals. The tracer that's being used binds to those terminals. And you can see on the top left slide, there is a kind of uh, with the orange and then the glowing uh, yellow. That's um, basically a print, if you like, of the tracer binding in a part of the brain called the striatum to dopamine receptors. And in the scan on the right beside it, you can see that it looks like you've got, like you've lost your commas, particularly on the left, you've got a full stop. And on the right, it looks a bit more like a comma. And that is a classic sign of Parkinson's where the tail in particular is lost first as the dopamine receptors are lost because of pathology, i.e. cell damage down in the midbrain. So these are very powerful techniques that we now have to help with the diagnosis. But as I've said before, and as it says at the top of the slide, never forget the patient sat in front of you because you can't over rely on tests. So as I've said at the start, some of you may have relations or have had relations with Parkinson's. It is a common neurodegenerative disease. The secular trend is aging in the population. And since age is the biggest risk factor to get Parkinson's, it's becoming more common. It's found worldwide. And if you have trouble remembering numbers, as some people do, then that sort of third bullet point, around 200 per 100,000 of the population affected, 1% of people over 65, 2% over 80 is a good rule of thumb. I've said increasing age is the biggest risk factor, but the youngest person I ever saw in clinic, in my adult clinic, with levodopa responsive Parkinson's was uh, 16. So that's a real rare case. Um, it does happen, but by and large, it becomes more common the older you get. And all of the studies suggest a slight male preponderance. We don't know whether that's down to, say, occupational exposure for, say, chemicals in the environment or whether it's hormonal factors that may protect um, women. We're, we're not sure about that. But every series across the world has pretty well confirmed that. As I always say in lectures and to students and, and to yourselves, all that shakes is not Parkinson's. Indeed, if you went down to Marks and Spencer's and you asked people down by the freezer section, how many, what's the classic sign of Parkinson's? I'll guarantee you that about nine out of 10 would say tremor. Well, in fact, even Charcot pointed out that you can have Parkinson's disease without tremor. The classic feature of Parkinson's is slow movement. 
And as I say, neurologists love Latin. So bradykinesia is slow and kinesia is movement. So bradykinesia, slow movement, is absolutely classic of Parkinson's disease and other sort of lookalike conditions which are featured in bullets point four, other neurodegenerative Parkinsonian syndromes. So they have slow movement, but they're not Parkinson's disease as such. And then it can also be mimicked by other things like a condition which is very common and actually is benign, but, but can confuse, and that's essential tremor. Certain drugs, particularly those used to treat mood disorders, psychosis, dizzy spells, can cause drug-induced Parkinsonism, and that goes away when you stop the offending drugs. It's worth looking out for. And then even older people with multiple infarcts, multiple small strokes, or Alzheimer's can appear to have superficially Parkinsonism. But Parkinson's disease, as we're discussing in this lecture, has got very characteristic pathology. So here's post-mortem, not MRI, post-mortem specimens of the brainstem. And the top um, slide uh, on the top left shows you the midbrain. Now that's flipped compared to the MRI scan where I said it looked like Mickey Mouse ears. If you see the Mickey Mouse ears are now pointing down and you can see that the, the, the black stuff, again, we love Latin names. So that's substantia nigra, nigra being black and substantia being substance is quite well demarcated in that top left image. Whereas if you go to the right, top right, it looks much more smudgy and less less pigmented. And that's the classic sign in the midbrain of somebody with Parkinson's at post-mortem. The slide below, the selections below, bottom left, are the pons. That's another part of the brain stem. Pons is bridge, and that connects the midbrain to the medulla. And you can see that, again, the arrows are showing a blue spot, the locus ceruleus. Wonderful. If you do Latin, your quid's in here. But they're wonderful words to bamboozle people. So blue spot and black stuff. Um, and you can see, again, the midbrain, sorry, the pond's bottom right hasn't got such a demarcated black spot at all. Now, the real classic um, for Parkinson's is the bottom colourful looking fried egg there in the remaining cell, which is a neuron. Uh, we call that a neuron. That's a nerve cell. And you can see that there's a dense staining blue core and a pale rim. And that is what Friedrich Levy described um, called a Louis body or Levy body. So that is an absolute classic hallmark of Parkinson's. So you can now impress your friends at school by saying, I know the classic pathology of Parkinson's, which is cell loss in pigmented brainstem nuclei, like the substantia nigra or the locus ceruleus, as well as Levy bodies in surviving nerve cells. That is the classic pathology. What causes all of that, quite frankly, is still something of a mystery. And here we've got a classic sort of Bermuda Triangle, if you like, of disease mechanisms that have been implicated in both genetic forms of Parkinson's disease, as well as non-genetic forms. And I really don't have time um, to go through this slide in any kind of detail. But suffice it to say that even this level of knowledge was None of this was known when I was training. It has all emerged in recent years. Um, and so it's exceedingly exciting times as we're trying to piece together this jigsaw to work out really A, the cause of Parkinson's, but then in turn, what might be tractable targets to develop new drugs and therapies. So how do you recognize Parkinson's in the clinic? Well, classic motor signs, I've already told you, when you go down to Marks and Spencer's and you're asking those 10 people about the classic signs, you're going to tell nine out of 10, ah, but you're wrong. It's not tremor, it's slow movement or bradykinesia. And if you can see me, I'm not, uh, hopefully you can on the, um, the, the, the camera, you test the bradykinesia by getting the patient to do finger taps. So thumb and first finger rapidly um, one, like this as quick as you can and keep them going now somebody with parkinson's may be a bit slow at the start and the amplitude between the first finger and the thumb progressively diminishes as they try to repeat the movement so this is decrement of movement it is slow movement so that is absolutely classic 
You might also get them to do this. And again, somebody with Parkinson's would look very slow, like they're moving the hand through quicksand. In terms of tremor, the classic tremor is a rest tremor. So you have the person with the hands on their lap in a semi-prone position. So I'm going to stand and I'll show you that you have the hand like this and you will see the thumb moving across rather like what used to be called pill rolling because that's how they used to make pills before machines did it. So it's a pill rolling tremor and about five times a second. There may be a bit of postural tremor with the arm outstretched, tends to emerge after a period of time, but the classic tremor for Parkinson's is at rest. Rigidity is felt by just moving the wrist up and down like this. It may feel like you're bending a piece of lead pipe with evenly increased resistance, but equally, because of the superimposed tremor, you may feel there's a cogging effect, so-called cogwheeling. So cogwheel rigidity, lead pipe rigidity are classic of Parkinson's, and it's often asymmetric at the start, so one side is worse than the other. That may result in the person not visibly swinging the arm on one side when they're walking. And if you ever bring your patient into clinic and you stand and watch them walk to you to come into your room, you can often diagnose Parkinson's before they even cross the threshold because they're not swinging their arm. And then late, late feature, not, not an early feature, is a tendency to fall through postural instability. Now, if I can tell you anything tonight, as well as infusing you with Parkinson about Parkinson's, it's that it's not just a motor disorder. Um, Non-motor symptoms are incredibly pervasive and actually probably more troublesome for the patient and their families than the motor symptoms where we have good treatments. So early features, and I mean very early features before the person's even sometimes been diagnosed with Parkinson's can be a loss of sense of smell Bizarrely, people have done tests with formal smell batteries and they find that things like oregano and oil of wintergreen are smells that particularly go early in people developing Parkinson's. So don't go rushing off to your herb garden or your, your pots of Schwartz herbs to check you can smell oregano because I'm sure you're all fine. But that is the sort of thing that goes. A violent type of dreaming, acting out behaviors of, in sleep is called REM sleep behavior disorder. That can result particularly in men who seem to have more violently enacted dreams in this disorder, like playing in golf or Newcastle or, or, um, or, 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 or throwing something or hitting somebody can actually result in injury and damage to the bed partner as well as themselves by throwing themselves out of bed. That kind of classic um, inability to not act out your dreams which we all have, of course, but they are actively acting them out, is called REM sleep behavior disorder. And that's a real classic early feature of what may then become Parkinson's. Constipation, believe it or not, is an early feature of Parkinson's, although clearly has low discriminatory value, as does depression and anxiety. And then later on, there can be problems with having to go to the toilet in a hurry, sometimes being incontinent. Of course, if your mobility is down, that can be a bad combination. Falling blood pressure on standing can be a problem. Seeing things, that's why I put much the night wanderer there. People hallucinate visually with Parkinson's and see things, for example, in curtains. I had somebody, somebody patient try to knife a curtain because they thought there was an intruder behind it, um, picking things off the floor, particularly patterned floors, thinking there's things there. And then frank dementia, which is more common in Parkinson's than in an age matched population, was something that I did a lot of research on. So late complications uh, are really troublesome, as you can imagine. Again, a real big take home message here is it's not all about the drugs, although they're incredibly important. Multidisciplinary approach is really, really key here. And so you, 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 you involve your physiotherapist, your speech and language therapist, your occupational therapist. You check the bone density to be sure they don't have osteoporosis or osteopenia and so on. And a nurse specialist. I mean, I still think I had the best nurse specialist work with me in the country in the clinic in Newcastle. And what they didn't know about Parkinson's, you could write on the back of a postage stamp. They were absolutely superb. And still are. So I think that, you know, it's a team effort to manage people with Parkinson's, that's for sure. 
So what do you do to treat people with Parkinson's? Well, this is another real success story. So following on Kotsias in 1967 and using gram doses of levodopa, we found out that by using something called a dopa decarboxylase inhibitor, it stopped the levodopa being broken down in places that you didn't want it being converted. So in other words, in the bloodstream. Before, you were using gram dose of levodopa. Only a tiny bit was getting into the brain because the rest was being broken down in the bloodstream by dopa decarboxylase. And what that led to was people being sick as you like and falling over with their blood pressure dropping into their boots because of side effects of the of, of dopamine in the bloodstream. So the dopa decarboxylase inhibitor allows you to use a much lower dose of levodopa. It doesn't cross into the brain, the dopa decarboxylase. So it allows the levodopa to get into the brain and be converted by the body's own enzymes into dopamine. If you and I, we normally make dopamine by the amino acid tyrosine, and you can see that at the top of the figure or outside the neuron, that's a, an idealized presynaptic neuron that's going into the nerve cell. It's being converted by tyrosine hydroxylase into dopa, then via dopa decarboxylase into dopamine. It's being packaged into vesicles like little shopping bags. And the shopping bags, when the nerve impulses come down the neuron, go towards the synaptic cleft, which is where you see that shopping bag look like it's throwing out red dots into the cleft. And the red dots are dopamine that then either go across to the dopamine receptor in the postsynaptic neurons or across a tiny, tiny space in the in the brain. The nerve cells talk to one another through the synaptic cleft and that stimulate there and then get taken back up by the dopamine transporter into the nerve cell presynaptically and either repackaged or through enzymes like that MAO, which is a monoamine oxidase type B inhibitor, uh, sorry, monoamine oxidase type B enzyme, get degraded and then kind of recycled. It's a bit like a re glorified recycling system. So all of the, nearly all of the treatments for Parkinson's disease have been based on this pathway that uh, Carlson and Ornakiewicz kind of unearthed back in their earlier animal experiments in 1957. So you've got levodopa, and that came around in 1973 in the form of a thing called Cinemet, and 1974 in a thing called Madapar. They've, they've got slightly fancier chemical names now, but a lot of us still call them Cinemet and Madapar. Um, they're still going strong. They're still brilliant drugs and very effective. Dopamine agonists I'll come on to in a second. They've had a slightly more checkered and stormy pathway, really, in terms of side effects that have emerged. Um, the, the dopamine agonist basically just acts directly on the postsynaptic neuron's dopamine receptor. It sort of cuts out the middleman, if you like, by not bothering with a presynaptic neuron, which sounds great in theory, but in practice, they're much weaker drugs and they have a range of rather unfortunate and sometimes unpleasant side effects. Blocking the breakdown of the dopamine is important. So you can block MAO, monoamine oxidase type B. And another enzyme, which we don't really need to go into, but this is another thing that breaks down dopamine and a catecholomethyltransferase. And these drugs are relatively new. A picapone of all the drugs that I've got on this slide is the newest kid on the block in terms of treatment. Amantadine's as old as the hills. We don't quite know how it works. It probably doesn't factor in to anything you're seeing on the figure on the right but it has a weak effect in Parkinson's and, and can have some effects on some of the motor side effects, which I'll come on to. And anticholinergics are the oldest drugs going full stop. They predated the use of levodopa by years and years and years. And they have a lot of side effects, particularly in older people. So not really to be recommended, if I'm honest. OK, so we always want to engage the person in their own treatment to understand why you're offering what you're offering and to let them make an informed choice. And I think that is just good general principles we'd all subscribe to. It's a very different scenario if, if a bricklayer with Parkinson's has to lay a number of bricks a day in order to make a living wage to keep their family in a house compared to somebody who's retired and who is basically at home most of the time. And so you really do probably want to individualize quite significantly the treatment you give. 
and involve them in making that decision. But also you must explain what the potential benefits, as, but also the harms are of the drugs that you might be wanting to use and make sure you document that because people have been taken to the courts and sued because they, it was claimed they did not give the potential risks associated with the drugs. And I'll explain in just a second and you'll grasp immediately why that can be such an issue. So there we go, levodopa. First used in clinical practice when man first walked on the moon. When Neil Armstrong was walking on the moon as the first man, um, levodopa was first used in clinical practice. And as I've said before, it's still the best oral medication for Parkinson's, despite all the other attempts, that drug from 1969 is still the best one going. And this was what I was telling you about the dopa decarboxylase inhibitor to reduce the overall dose of levodopa you give. It's down into hundreds of milligrams now, not grams. And these were the fancy names, cocaryl dopa and cobenyl dopa that we now use for what are, oh, in, in old fashioned terms, when I was uh, training, known as Cinemet and Madapar, respectively. So the correct name, and I don't want to give you all bad habits before you've even started training as doctors, is cocaryl dopa is cinnamed, cobenyl dopa, and they are the names you probably should use. Now, the problem with levodopa is twofold. Firstly, it has no effect on the disease progression. So it doesn't stop you getting the dementia. It doesn't stop you having problems with hallucinations. In fact, it can sometimes make it worse. But the other problem is that if you use the drug excessively, or even if you use it carefully over a number of years, it can lead to a number of motor side effects, which are what we call, again, back to the Latin, dysabnormal and kinesia movement. Now, that is particularly and ironically and paradoxically more troublesome when you use the drug high dose, particularly in younger patients. Now, I'll show you in the next slide it looks horribly complicated, but I'll explain it to you what, what we're meaning here. So the levodopa, when you first give it to people in the form of cocaryl dopa or cobenyl dopa, is used in mild so a stages at the top of Parkinson's, so early mild Parkinson's, then you've got moderate, and then you've got severe. So if I walk you through it, when you start out, the levodopa goes up from the oral tablet, up in the bloodstream, peaks, and then drops. And you've got a very, very wide therapeutic window. That's the white bit between the dark blue at the bottom and the light blue at the top. So you could give a big dose of levodopa and actually not really run into many problems and think you're doing good because the person's benefiting from it. Unfortunately, as the condition progresses, that therapeutic window evidenced by the white funnel, if you like, or the white tr triangle effect, narrows so that by the time you're severe you're taking a dose of levodopa as in the sine wave and you've got a lot of time spent underdosed as in the dark blue and a lot of do a lot of time spent in the dyskinetic state the light blue and relatively little time in what you would call optimal therapeutic state now, the dyskinesias are, or the person, if, if you see the video that I'm now, can literally be writhing all over the place, sometimes very violently, more so than I've just demonstrated, through, if you like, overdosing from a tablet of levodopa. That then wears off, and the person anticipates and is desperate for their next tablet, and that is called wearing off effect. So this is a problem with advanced Parkinson's where the levodopa still works, but its effects are very, very variable and very, at times, unpredictable. And it really is very damaging to the person because they can't predict when they're going to be good and able to do things, particularly if they're going outdoors, for example. So that kind of led to these other drugs coming along, thinking, well, we can either delay the onset of these motor problems or we can spare the amount of levodopa we give by giving another drug with it. So that's where the dopamine agonists came along. But there are problems. Dopamine agonists, let's deal with them first, have got limited effect. They're, they're not very strong drugs. And some of the side effects, believe it or not, are quite strange. Like this panel 
and with the ergo agonist related valve disease that is actually somebody's mitral and tricuspid valve being being imaged using an echocardiogram like an ultrasound bounced off the the valves of the heart and it leads to problems literally destruction in some cases of the tricuspid valve in the heart so the heart valve can be damaged by the the dopamine agonist which is of course horrendous the drugs can also affect um, fibrosis in the lung so it causes restriction in in breathing and it can actually cause fibrosis behind the the kidneys that can lead to difficulty with urine passing urine and and problems with kidney function so these were all things that started to emerge they then brought along a different class of dopamine agonists saying aha we've cracked it these particular dopamine agonists do not cause any of those fibrotic side effects that i've told you about but then the problem there became that they were much more associated with addictive behaviors and actually um, some serious issues like gambling, hypersexuality um, and, and repetitive behaviors. So people were literally losing their houses, losing their businesses by gambling excessively with the brakes gone off in terms of being able to control their, their behaviors. I had patients taken to court because of, you know, accusations of lewd behavior. Um, and and, and, and I, I, I won't go into detail, but essentially, you know, it was caused by the dopamine agonist, this particular class of dopamine agonist. And when that was realized, obviously, they fortunately did not end up in, in prison. Um, but but of course, they could have then in turn sued the doctor had those side effects not been explained and documented. Hence, my comment to you about making sure you explain and involve the patient in the therapeutic decision and make sure you've documented side effects. And then you heard me talk about amantadine, a rather old drug that we don't quite know how it works. That can cause bizarrely thickening of the lower legs and this rash called levido reticularis. So we're not out of the woods with the treatment of Parkinson's. We've got good drugs, but they do have limitations. So then other things have come along quite excitingly different ways of administering drugs for Parkinson's. So these are not oral therapies as such. They are needing like apomorphine. That's not morphine, by the way. It's a it's an unfortunate name that makes it sound like it's going to be some addictive substance and making you high. It's nothing like that, actually. But it's a very powerful anti-Parkinsonian drug that works on dopamine receptors, amongst others. And it's given using a little uh, pump that the person can carry around in a belt or in a little bag on a belt and the needle goes just underneath the skin, very shallow. So that's apomorphine. It's been around a wee while, but we've got better at using it. And it generally is best given as a continuous infusion over around 12 hours. And that can really smooth things out with regard to the motor control. Duodopa is a novel preparation of levodopa, making it more soluble. And that's put into a cassette which is quite a big clunky thing, although again, they're getting better at reducing that size through better chemistry and preparation. And believe it or not, that is administered through this pump, this, this pump and tube, which is inserted through the abdominal wall into the stomach, held in place by this bouton, that sort of wheel thing you see. And then the, the pipe, which runs through, in actually it's a misnomer because it's the jejunum that it ends up in. Um, the pipe should go into the jejunum, which is where the levodopa is absorbed. And that, again, can have the effect of smoothing out the control of somebody with Parkinson's. Now, the other thing that perhaps grasps the public attention more than anything is brain surgery for Parkinson's. And that's moved on a whole lot. So deep brain stimulation, zapping with stimulation, certain parts of the brain, usually very deep location, identified using MRI scanning. And the MRI scanner gives a brilliant roadmap for how the surgeon can then work out the coordinates in three dimensions and then introduces a very, very fine lead into the area of interest. This is really deep down in the brain. It's fed through the brain tissue into those structures. And then the box, which you can see here, pulse generator, is attached by the lead that goes into the brain and you can program the pulse generator 
myriad of ways in terms of frequency, amplitude, bandwidth, and so on and so forth, which an expert can then adjust in order to get the best response to lead to benefits in Parkinson's. And in, in short, this has been a bit of a game changer in a number of cases of Parkinson's. And the area that is currently the flavor of the month is actually the bottom panel um, on the right, an area, tiny area called the subthalamic nucleus, which is around the size of an almond, a small almond. So it's a very small target. Okay, then just to finish up with the future, what is it called? Well, we've got an awful lot of things still to crack with Parkinson's. I've talked about the dyskinesias. These are the, the movements that people get with the levodopa working too, too well, if you like. Um, very unsightly, very disabling. There's been many companies try and many companies fail to make drugs that you could give that would actually knock the top end off those movements, i.e. stop the movements being so violent, yet not lose the benefit of the levodopa. And they've generally done that by going through other neurotransmitter or chemical systems in the brain. But really, that nut has not yet been cracked. The dementia of Parkinson's, which I kind of devoted my most of my research time to, it's, it's, there have been new drugs appear, but they're not that effective, and they're still, it's still a really problematic area. Are there other surgical targets that we could use that might tackle other parts of the Parkinson's syndrome? So in other words, this really bizarre sounding name, pedunculopontine nucleus, you know now where the pons is, it's in the brainstem, and it's a very long, ill-defined nucleus, this one, but it's been picked out because it, it was said it might help with some of the gait problems in Parkinson's. In fact, it's probably going to fall, I suspect, into not, not being used at all because the benefits are really not probably worth the side effects and problems that accrue from that. The thing that really sets the public's mind alight is using things like stem cells and gene therapy and like putting, um, if you like, synthetic dopamine from one source or another, or indeed in, 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 in older times, taking aborted fetus midbrain and, and clustering multiple aborted fetus midbrain together and then injecting that into the midbrain of somebody with Parkinson's to allow the dopamine cells to grow and generate dopamine to replace the use of the tablets now obviously that has a number of ethical issues that may not be something that would be appealing to any of you really uh, or, or, or some of you but clearly a proof of principle that the swedish groups did in particular was showed an amazing response actually in select patients and then the sort of holy grail if you will is trying to find disease modifying therapies things that will slow down the condition now this look at this slide this is quite something, isn't it? I mean, this is from a fairly relatively recent um, lecture that I had to give at the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society about a review of the year and what's kind of coming through. And the wheel on the right, I mean, I couldn't begin to explain what some of these products are, but you can see they've kind of been craftily laid out from this publication where above the sort of um, between nine o'clock and three o'clock, you've got disease modifying therapies in development. And below the line, you've got drugs to try and treat the symptoms of Parkinson's. Starting from the outer ring, you've got things that at the moment are largely just chemical numbers uh, or name, uh, barely, barely sort of given a, a proper name. So that means they're at the earliest phase of development. And then as you go in towards the bullseye, heading towards the centre, you've got drugs that have progressed into higher phase studies with bigger numbers of patients because they've gone past the sort of filter of the phase one studies, the phase two studies, and then, then getting closer to um, kind of market. And the sad thing is you can see, which is pretty obvious, that there are loads of drugs in the outer ring, and then they sort of drop off, particularly as you get to phase three and a name. And that basically means that a lot of products are failing at early stages of development because they just either are too toxic or they don't have clinical benefit. So... It's a very active area, but it's certainly one that I'm afraid is, is still, you know, asking more questions and giving answers. 
there are, you remember I mentioned right at the start, synuclein and how important that is in the pathology of Parkinson's. And we're now looking at all sorts of ways of trying to, if you like, vaccinate against this rogue synuclein. And I don't have time to go into this because I want to leave time for questions for you all. But effectively, people are looking to try and literally like you get your sort of um, your, your vaccines for to go abroad and your vaccine for COVID. Well, people are being given synuclein peptide vaccines. And this these, these two trials on this slide were both appearing back to back in probably one of the most prestigious journals going. And they, they literally came out together in the same edition with these almost unpronounceable names, which are effectively monoclonal antibodies, which are binding to synuclein, subtly different areas, but very similar design trials to try to see whether by giving this, 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 this monoclonal antibody against alpha synuclein, you could slow down the progression of Parkinson's. And you hold your breath, and then I show you the first trial, the Simpanimab trial, and the, you don't need to be knowing how much to interpret this kind of data too much to see that there is no significant difference in these lines. And if you look at the top, you can see the control is in a kind of gray. The lower dose sepanimab is in the yellow, up to the highest dose in that sort of dark royal blue. And sadly, there was just no difference between the two uh, in this rather large trial. And then I show you the next trial, the prazinizumab trial, and again, you can see that with two different doses of that monoclonal antibody versus a placebo, i.e. A dummy, a dummy therapy, there is no significant difference. So you can imagine how much that cost the drug companies to get a negative trial and how disappointing that is. So it's very much a case of turn again, Dick Whittington, and let's not be despondent. Let's try and work out why this has failed and see if we can refine the therapies in future. Final point really is that we've got to get smarter and better at being more inclusive in our trials. A lot of trials exclude older people, which is a bit ironic when it comes to the fact that people with Parkinson's are often older than, than, than most people. They also tend to exclude, exclude people with multiple other medical conditions. And sadly, that is now becoming the norm rather than the exception. So you'd have to question the validity of a drug that works in people with purely Parkinson's, but have other medical problems as well. And then, oh, sorry, but don't have other medical problems as well, because that is not reflecting real life. And then, of course, ethnically, historically and shockingly, a lot of people from ethnic backgrounds are not included in trials, often because they are not in, as engaged, that the trialists don't reach out as well to those populations. And so ethnicity can have quite a, quite a skew or lack of diversity in that area. And we've got to be better at being more inclusive. So the last slide, I've started with a sort of history, if you like, Parkinson's. Um, huge, huge progress since 1817. But, you know, the big questions really are, do surgical techniques and new targets, do they have more to offer? Probably, maybe, but it'll be, I suspect, ultimately limited. Can we identify improved drugs for motor symptoms? Massively active area. In my life as a, as a neurologist, there have been so many casualties there. I'm becoming a little cynical, but I still hope that something can be identified to refine the current pretty good oral therapy, but it could be improved. How can we help treat the dementia and the hallucinations and other non-motor symptoms better? That is a really big unmet need. Can we discover and safely introduce disease modifying therapies that if you were diagnosed, God forbid, tomorrow or next year or in 20 years time with Parkinson's, that you could take something that would actually stop it in its tracks or slow it significantly to give you a much better quality of life over many years. And then finally, can we identify people with very early Parkinson's? What about people with a loss of sense of smell, people with a REM sleep behavior disorder, so that they haven't even got motor symptoms, but you can get right in early when they've got many, many more nerve cells remaining in the brain with disease modifying therapy to stop them even getting that far. So there you go. That's a, a kind of a whistle stop tour 
of Parkinson's, past, present and future.